And now we come to the time for the reading of our scriptures. Good morning once again. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to be reading to you out of the Old Testament, the book of Psalms 86, 1 through 10, and I'm going to drop down to 16 and 17. And the second reading will be from the New Testament, Romans 6, 1 through 11. I hope I have that right, so I'll start now. Yes, sir. Psalm 86. Hear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am devoted to you. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I call to you all day, all day long. Bring joy to your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. You are forgiving and good, O Lord, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. In the day of my trouble, I will call to you, for you will answer me. Among the gods, there is none like you, O Lord. No deeds can compare with, your, with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, O Lord. They will bring glory to your name, for you are for you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. I'm going to drop down to 16 and 17. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Grant your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Give me a sign of your goodness that my enemies may see it and be put to shame. For you, O oh Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Amen, amen. And I'm going to go to the New Testament, Romans 6. That's Romans 6, 1 through 11. We just had that. Give me a minute here. Romans 6, 1 through 11. Dead to sin, alive in Christ. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may be increased? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in any, any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ had, was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too shall live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in death, we will certainly be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death, of, the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Um, in, the way, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive with God in Christ. Amen. 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 May God add a blessing to the hearing of his word. And since we don't have... Good morning. Good morning, Faith. Ah, there he is. Praise God. Praise God. My backup plan, borrowing another computer, worked. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Welcome. So please forgive me, and I'll explain another time. But for the music ministry, I would like to offer two short pieces. Uh, in celebration of our fathers, Faith of our Father, I'd like to play just a verse of that, Faith of our Fathers, Amen. Honor Our Fathers, Living and uh, Deceived. And the music ministry uh, piece that I'd like to play is City Called Heaven, which was programmed earlier. Amen. I heard of a city called Heaven. I'm trying to make it my home. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Beautiful, Carl. Thank you. We appreciate so much your sharing your gifts. And uh, if you want to do your rendition of I Surrender All, we'd love to hear that as well. But if not, it's up to you. Amen. Thank you. Praise God. And now we come to the time in our service and thanking you, Brother Blake, for continuing to get connected so that we could be blessed by your music. Indeed, we appreciate it. And now we come to the time in our service 
when Minister Matthew Beach, and he really doesn't need introduction, but there are some new people on our uh, Zoom service since the time Matthew started worshiping with us. So I will say just a couple of brief things that Matthew is a brilliant uh, PhD student scholar at the Graduate Theological Union. He hails from Galveston, Texas, and I'm sure he will be talking about that in his sermon. But Matthew first came to us a couple of years ago with his parents um, on a visit to the Bay Area just to uh, attend Faith Church and to meet people. And he has shared how much it reminded, how much we, our church, our small congregation, reminds him of his uh, beloved community uh, back where he served in Texas. And so he has continued to worship with us and uh, to pray with us and to preach with us from time to time. So let us just lift our hands in hallelujah thanksgiving for the ministry of Matthew Beach, praying for God's continued blessings on his studies and his anointing. And now the voice that you will hear will be Minister Matthew Beach, who is studying in the Presbyterian Church. Amen. Thank you, Valerie. Good morning, Faith. It's really good to be back. Um, before I begin, I just want to apologize if there's any noise. It's super noisy in my apartment complex, so I apologize for that ahead of time. There's not a whole lot I can do about that. Let us have a prayer of illumination first. God of strength and courage, in Jesus Christ, you set us free from sin and death and call us to the risk of faith and service. Give us grace to follow him who gave himself for others, that by our service we may discover new life grounded in him. Amen. Every social and political struggle for justice in society is accompanied by a parallel struggle within the church over doctrine. When abolitionists struggled to dismantle the social institution of slavery, they did so with the clear knowledge that the church undergirded that system with the distorted doctrine of creation. They knew that the evil of slavery began with a false perception of reality and would not end without fundamentally altering that perception. Behind the women's ordination or behind the women's suffrage movement was a parallel movement within the church to reformulate the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Because if we say that we believe in the freedom of God, then surely we must affirm that God's spirit can speak through any vessel of God's choosing. The right to vote corresponded to a long and courageous struggle to recognize women's ordination in the church. And when freedom fighters took to the streets of Birmingham, Alabama in early May, 1963, they did so with the explicit recognition that many of their white brethren across town were clinging to a distorted theology which was used to justify segregation. Their struggle was not only a moral one, but a theological one, because you cannot reform society without also reforming the church. And so as I look out these past few weeks and see courageous Black Lives Matter protesters marching through our streets for dignity and justice, I am reminded that we live in a profound moment of change, a time of judgment when the church is called upon to take a stand. And as one called to be a doctor of divine mysteries, it is my duty and my obligation to consider the doctrines of the church. The question that I put before you this morning is the question of human nature. What do we believe about humanity? This is what we theologians call theological anthropology. And I pose this question not for mere speculation, but because the character of God is at stake. For if we cannot get clear about ourselves, then we cannot get clear about the God we worship. Every doctrine of the creature says something fundamental 
about its creator. This is a life or death question. The white supremacist structures ravaging society are rooted in a false theological anthropology, a false anthropology that fundamentally opposes the gospel of Jesus Christ as preached by the Apostle Paul in Romans. According to Paul's anthropology, the many follow the pattern of the one. Either all of humanity follows the pattern of Adam or all of humanity follows the pattern of Christ. What the one does, first Adam and then later Christ, spreads to all alike. And so he says, just as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so through one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. What Paul has in mind here is an analogy borrowed from Greek philosophy. Imagine, if you will, a clear glass of water in which you place a single drop of blue food coloring. Within moments, the entire glass of water changes color. There is not one ounce of water left untouched by the blue food dye. According to this analogy, the glass is like the earth and humanity is, is the water. One single drop of food coloring fundamentally transforms the totality of humanity. Not one single ounce, not one little portion, but the whole of it. This is what Paul has in mind when he says that one man's trespass led to condemnation for all. Adam's disobedience was like a drop of food coloring that permeated the whole earth. As Adam's heirs, what was his by nature became ours by consequence. And if one man's disobedience transformed the whole of humanity, then so too does one man's obedience lead to justification for all. What Christ did fundamentally transformed the whole. Christ is like a different color food dye, if we follow our analogy. One drop of Christ placed in a glass of water, the earth, the whole of humanity is changed and transformed. What was Christ by nature becomes ours by grace, as theology says. This one unique man, Jesus of Nazareth, fundamentally alters the state of humanity. For Paul, there is not one sector of humanity unchanged by Jesus Christ and what he did. There are not some people set against others. What happens to the one happens to the many alike. For, call, for Paul, there is only one categorical division that matters, that between the creator and the creature. So when Paul poses his rhetorical question that launches today's scripture reading, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? He issues a direct challenge to the individualist who would misinterpret his theological anthropology. When Paul says that grace increased where sin increased, he isn't talking about individual sins. He's got the collective in mind. As heirs to Adam's disobedience, all humans are sinful by nature. Adam's disobedience permeated the whole. Of course, many of those sins were hidden until the law shed light on them. So when God gave Moses the gift of Torah, it, it brought those sins to light. It made visible what had previously been hidden. And that's why Paul says, sin abounded. So when Paul says grace abounds where sin abounds, what he means is that just as Adam was the paradigm for sinful humanity, so too is Christ the paradigm of new life. If we were once heirs to Adam's disobedience, we are now heirs to Christ's obedience. His merit abounds for us. Grace fundamentally alters humanity. Paul's grace-sin dichotomy, therefore, is the promise that what Christ achieves is on offer to the whole of humanity. Now, I have heard it recently said by some of my fellow theologians that racism is a sin like any other, 
and that because it is a sin, it will always be with us. And that is a pernicious lie that we must be unequivocal in denouncing. Yes, racism is a moral evil, but it is fundamentally different from sin in general. According to Paul's anthropology, sin is something that affects all alike. All are sinful and have fallen short of the glory of God, he says. According to Paul, what Adam does and then later what Christ does transforms the whole. But racism is grounded on a false theological anthropology that says some people are categorically different from others, as if a drop of dye placed in water does not suffuse the whole. And therein is the lie. Racism is not natural, and we don't have to put up with it. Paul lived in a world without systemic racism. I tell you this just by way of example. While there were many things that we might fault Paul and his contemporaries for, racism was not one of them. The moral evil of slavery did exist in Paul's time, but it was not a racialized institution. It was still evil, but I want you to understand that racism was not a part of it. The ancient world had no concept of race. It was widely recognized that Humanity and all humans had myriad differences, but humanity was not systematically segregated into separate categories according to any perception of appearance. Racism is a modern invention of the European mind. Over a century before the first Africans were for forcibly taken to the shores of American colonies, Theologians of the Spanish court devised elaborate theological explanations for why they believed black and brown bodies were, quote, were, quote, deserved, unquote, to be enslaved. And I tell you this not to reignite the pain and the horror of that evil, but I want you to understand what is at stake. Every moral evil is grounded on a theological heresy every moral evil. The colonization of the Americas was grounded on an anthropology that said some people were less than others, less rational, less intelligent, less capable. It is this less than that implies God is only the God of some and not all. The systematic enslavement torture and extermination of black and brown bodies during the colonial era was grounded on an anthropology which cast some as categorically less than others. And lest we think this anthropology of less than disappeared with the abolishment of slavery, its consequences permeate every vestige of American life today. Nearly every institution in America be it healthcare, education, law enforcement, every institution is grounded on the logic that some are fundamentally less than others. The recent COVID outbreak at San Quentin State Prison displays this. It has been linked to the systemic maltreatment of inmates during transfer of which the majority were people of color. Reports indicate that had wardens treated the prisoners according to proper healthcare protocol, that is, if they had only treated the prisoners as human beings deserving of dignity, the COVID outbreak could have been avoided altogether. You don't get mass incarceration and massive health disparities among black and brown communities. You don't get children being ripped from their parents and thrown into cages along the border. You don't get the racist murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and countless others without first being possessed by a false anthropology that casts some bodies as less than others. Racism is not natural. It is not a matter of just personal sin inherent to the human psyche. We can live in a world without structural racism, but that world will not come to be until we recognize that the false anthropology undergirding racism is a lie. 
Paul closes out his reading with a powerful consider. Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Consider where you stand. We who accept the grace that has been offered to all are called to a greater responsibility. Christ has set us free so that the, we may be empowered to set others free. The time is now for change. At this very moment, God's judgment rests upon our shoulders. This is not a time for fear, but a time for courage, a time to take a stand for justice. It is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called a confessional state. The church universal is thrown into a confessional state whenever the body of Christ is threatened by heresy. South Africa during apartheid was thrown into a confessional state. 1930s Germany under Adolf Hitler was thrown into a confessional state. Today in America, we are living in a confessional state. The Holy Spirit is calling upon the church to take a stand for justice. White supremacy is a threat, not only to Christ, but to the faithful who make up his body. We are being called to dismantle structural racism by disowning the false anthropology that undergirds it. Today is also Father's Day, a day of celebration. And Friday was Juneteenth, the day of liberation, when the Emancipation Proclamation was publicly announced in the city of my birth. As we celebrate this Father's Day, let us remember the fathers and the mothers as well who were fathers of our faith before us. Those courageous theologians and pastors and lay people and freedom fighters who heard the call of the Holy Spirit and took a stand for justice. We honor their courage by standing with them and joining with them in the struggle. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can see the, the hands and the gratitude and the praise going around and thanking you for speaking truth to power. The courage in your sermon, Matthew, and in the convictions of your heart is apparent. And the power in it is that you can share in places where we can't, just as we can share in places where you may not have access to. So if we all understand this theology of justice that our creator God create, created us in the image of God to be one people of God, then we pray this world can be a better place. Thank you so much so much for your message. Praise God. And so now we come to the time in our service where we have a call to discern. It is a time when we invite you to reflect not only on the powerful message that was shared with us today, but to reflect on the meaning in the music and in the shared expressions that we have experienced together and to discern, as Matthew says, where God is in our humanity. We invite you to just quietly in the sanctuary of your homes to search your heart and to ask the Holy Spirit to be present. Lord God, in these few seconds of silence, we now lift up and join our hearts in prayer to thank you, to thank you for this message, to thank you for this time of worship, to thank you for the spirit of praise that needs to be in our hearts. Even though we don't have a physical sanctuary, each body assembled is a temple 
and a sanctuary to you. And so we thank you, O oh God. We praise you. We glorify you. We worship you. And we give you thanks for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Hear our prayers, and may we hear your voice. And so it is. Amen. And so as we go forth to enjoy this Father's Day, or as we wrestle with the memories that we have of perhaps not so pleasant relationships with fathers, whatever our situation, we have a holy parent that holds us close and walks with us. There may be someone, perhaps a stepfather, a surrogate father, a godfather, a coach, a teacher, who still served as a role model to you and we give thanks for them. For each of you, the brothers in our community, and as Daryl said at the start of our service, we realize that you are few, but your presence is mighty and your presence is appreciated. And so we are charged, despite limitations, to go forward and to be the church despite limitations, to carry trust and hope in our hearts, despite limitations, to speak truth and justice and to encourage someone along the way. And so this week, go in the peace and the power of our Lord. May the spirit of the Lord surround you and keep you for those who are having to still go to work as essential workers. We continue to lift you up and asking for God's presence and mercy to be with you. For those of you who are among the sick and shut in, trust that God is there and holding your hand. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Hallelujah and amen. And now we move towards our closing song. This concludes our service, but as we did last week, please take the time just to wave at each other, to say goodbye until we meet again. Minister Page, we saw you. We thank you for being with us. 
Miss Janice and Terry Hilliard, Danita and Jeffrey, hallelujah. Mary Zeno and Mary Madden, Sharon Thompson and her beautiful mother, hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. And Brother Willie Collins and Vicki Collins and Robin Goins and Robin Winbush is with us on today and Big Jeannie and Ali, hallelujah. Thank you all for being with us. And we love you. We pray for you. Stay safe and healthy until we meet again. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Bye. -bye. God be with you till we meet again. Amen. Amen.